So we made an argument in our last class about why statement number one here is true. That in the additive group of integers mod n, the element one, in other words, the equivalence class of one mod n, is a generator for this group. Why? What did we say in our last class was the reason for that? Why does one generate z mod n? How do I know if you hand me a k arbitrarily out of this group, how do I know I can make that k out of a power, quote unquote, of one? What power of one do I need in order to produce k? <coughs> well, yeah, the nth power is going to take me back around to the identity, zero. But the kth power, and by power, remember, we mean the iterated application of the group operation, which here is addition. So the power is really adding one to itself mod n k times. Right? And when I do that, I will indeed get k. Whoops. So that's, that's the proof, right? If I apply this group operation of addition mod n to 1 itself, iteratively, added to itself k times, is going to give me k. So for any element in my group, I can produce it as a power of the element 1. So 1 is a generator. That's the definition of generator. Generator means every element in the group is a power of this one thing. Um, is there another element in Z mod n that's guaranteed to also be a generator? Let's think, let's get specific for a minute until we get our feet wet. Let's suppose n is equal to 5. If n is equal to 5, then the elements in my group I can think of like a five-hour clock. And 1 is a generator because if I start at the identity and I add 1 repeatedly, I'm going to hit every single element in this group. 4 plus 1 gets me back to 0. Can you think of another way? to generate all the elements of this group by repeated additions of the same number. Let's try two. Four, one, three, zero. Yeah, check it out. If we try two, uh, zh, zh, zh. then yeah. Uh, if I add two, I'll go here. If I add two again, two plus two is four. Four plus two is one. <coughs> one plus two is three. Three plus two is zero. So two is a generator for this group. One is a generator for this group. Um, what are some others? <laughs> you, you set all the possibilities. So three is a generator. Plus three gives me three plus three is one. One plus three is four. Four plus three is two. Two plus three is zero. So three is a generator. Zero is the only one that's not a generator. Is zero ever a generator for a cyclic, finite cyclic group? There's one finite cyclic group of which it's the order of the generator. The group that only has the identity element in it, the trivial group. Yeah, yeah. In that case, yes. Uh, but any, every, every other case, no. Because of the identity property, we're not going to get anywhere other than the identity by adding the identity to itself. Um, but look at what happens when I add 4. 0 plus 4 is 4. 4 plus 4 is 3. 3 plus 4 is 2. 2 plus 4 is 1. 1 plus 4 is 0. So there's what happens when I add 4. So, the, uh, say that again? They all, have the same order. they all have the same order. What is the order of all these elements? Five. five. All those are elements of order five, which again, the fact that they are order five, and so is the group, a group of order five, that means that all four of these things are generators, right? because their powers generate every element in the group, <coughs> all five of them. Uh, OK, so this was the case for Z mod five. What about Z mod six? What would you predict? would be the generators for Z mod 6 based on the previous example. Was it one, two, three, four, and 5. So 1 is going to give us this 
pattern here, right? Add one repeatedly, we're eventually six times gonna come back around to ourselves. Order of the element one is six. Um, how about two? Uh oh, what do you mean no? Yeah, there's the problem, right? When I start adding twos repeatedly, I end up prematurely getting back to zero, right? Why? What is it about two in this example that makes us get back to the identity prematurely where it didn't happen in the previous example? Because two divides six. Yeah, well, granted, one divides six also, right? But two divides six, a non-trivial amount, right? Um, that after only three steps, we get back to the identity. So the order of two in Z mod six is three. And three also doesn't work because what happens with it? It just goes back and forth. Zero to three, three back to zero. So the order of three in Z mod six is two. Yeah, four doesn't work for the same reason that two doesn't work. Its order is equal to three. Um, because adding four, notice, is the same as going clockwise around this little triangle. Because adding four in Z mod six is the same as subtracting two. And adding three in Z mod four is the same as subtracting three. Exactly. And so three, for the same reason, um, goes around the other way. Um, OK, but give me one more example of a generator then. Besides one, what else generates Z mod six? Five. Because adding five is the same as subtracting, subtracting one. And so we're just going counterclockwise around that red loop right? if I add five repeatedly. And I will generate every element of the group. So with those observations in our, in our back pocket, can you make a prediction about Z mod n in general? Besides one, what other element will generate Z mod n? What other generator will we have? n minus one. n minus one. N minus one. Why? Four. Because it's the opposite of one. Yes, it's the opposite of one. Oh, exactly. <laughs> You've got it. 100% gold star, Megan. Yes. Great. It's the opposite of one. And so, so here's, here's, the, here's the generalization of that argument, right? If A is a generator for a cyclic group, what else is also a generator for that cyclic group? Negative A, A, A inverse. Yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. So that's a statement that we could prove. I don't want to do it right now, but we could prove it. Um, if A generates G, then A inverse also generates G. Right, and so that's how we know that every finite cyclic group, um, as long as its order is bigger than two, because if its order was equal to two, A and A inverse would actually be the same, right? One and minus one are the same in Z mod two. Um, but as long as we have more than two elements in my group, A and A inverse are gonna be different. And so we'll have two different generators, at least two different generators. In the case of Z mod five, we found that there are four different generators that we could make. Um, and whether or not we can generate the entire group seems to have something to do with divisibility. Is that true? Because five is prime. Because, well, five is prime. So let's, let's make that into a conjecture before we, we walk off of that. What do you think we can say about Z mod P, where P is prime? How many generators will it have? N minus one. Yeah, or where the role of N is played by, one. yeah, it has P minus one. Because what's the only element that doesn't generate? Yeah. So one of the things I want to talk about in tomorrow's uh, live stream um, are, is this very question about how do we count how many generators there are for a given cyclic group. That's the same thing as counting how many elements of a specific order uh, exist inside of a cyclic group. And that's a, that turns out to be a number theoretic question. Right? The answer doesn't come from abstract algebra. The answer comes from the theory of the arithmetic of the integers, number theory. Um, so this is the most number theory that we're going to do all semester, but this is the place to do it because number theory holds the secrets of how finite cyclic groups operate. So what I'm going to ask you to do between now and our next class, I want to kind of get you kick-started now um, with the last couple minutes that we have here, um, is to, so who's seen the Euclidean algorithm before? Most of us. Cool. Um, it tends to be one of those things that shows up in eclectic places in the math curriculum. You might have seen it in Math 180, I want to say. Yeah, you probably did. Yeah, you probably did some in where? 
cryptology. Cryptology, even better. Yeah, that's a great place for it to show up. Cryptology is nothing, I mean, cryptology is linear algebra and abstract algebra and number theory all smooshed into one umbrella. So perfect place for it. Um, but, so what does the Euclidean algorithm do? Just to wrap this up. Right, the Euclidean algorithm finds the greatest common divisor of two integers, right? Um, and the, as a result, it should be able to tell us something about the order of a given element inside of a finite cyclic group. So for example, when I can't draw the, the clock face as easily as we did here, if I have, for example, a clock that has 128 points along its face and I want to start adding 36s, um, how can I figure out what the order of 36 is inside of Z128 and so forth? Um, so just to, just to get us all on the same page about how the Euclidean algorithm works, um, let me just work out one example uh, for us to sort of close with here. Um, maybe I'll pick, suppose I want to find the greatest common divisor of uh, 96 and 512. So how does the Euclidean algorithm do this? Well, we're looking for divisibility. So the first division problem that we would do is to try to divide 96 into 512. How many times does that go? Numbers. Yeah, see, now we're actually doing math, right? Uh, that goes five times, does it not? Because uh, then five times 96 is going to be 480? No, 400. And... What we've just done is we've found a quotient and a remainder, right? We've really just expressed 512 as 5 times 96. And then the remainder that we add on is 32. We might also say that what we learn in this equation is we learn that 512 is congruent mod 96 to what? 32. The remainder when we divide by uh, 96. Right? So 512 is congruent to 32 mod 96. Um, and then the next step is we shift everything down. So 96 becomes our new dividend. 32 becomes our new divisor. And so now I'll just put in here a 96. And now we do another division problem. Um, this one actually happens to turn out exactly right. 96 is 3 times 32 plus 0. Right? There's no remainder on that one. I hope it's three. Um, and so here we are at the, at the end of the problem. Uh, and we've, we've terminated the Euclidean algorithm because our remainder now is zero. Um, where in this process do we find the greatest common divisor? It's the, last it's the last remainder that's not zero. So right here or right there. There's the greatest common divisor. It turns out to be 32. Um, so that's how the Euclidean algorithm works. Now we, in this class, don't have the time to really prove why it works. Uh, what you'll notice is that every time you do one step, all of the numbers get smaller, and they can never get <laughs> below zero. Right? So we know it has to terminate. Um, but the fact that it finds the greatest common divisor is worth proving in some class, probably not ours. Um, so get some practice with this and look at these last couple of questions. What we want to do is make the argument for how do we know what the orders of subgroups inside of cyclic groups are.